Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the next session in Global Health Corps Shift Happen series. We are having a discussion today on the cultural barriers to vaccine uptake and how we can better understand how to address vaccine hesitancy in our communities. I'm Hannah Taylor. I'm GHC's Director of Community Impact. And I'm delighted to be here with our exceptional panelists and moderator. At this moment in our world's history, where many, we can see the end um, of the suffering and the turmoil and the fear that COVID-19 has caused because of these medical advancements and a vaccine, yet we also know that there is still fear and hesitancy towards that vaccine uptake that could ultimately undermine our efforts to curb the disease and stop its spread. And so really glad to be here with these exceptional panelists who each bring a wealth of professional experience working with communities and helping them to thrive, while also understanding the cultural norms and concerns to really fully participate in medical interventions. So I'm really grateful um, to each of them for taking some time to be with us today and share on this topic. And thankful to each of you for joining this conversation. Uh, it's a really imperative moment in our world's history as we do roll out the COVID-19 vaccine around the world. It's my honor um, to be able to introduce our moderator today, Tracy Kubatindo. Tracy is a GHC alumna from our 2015-2016 cohort. She is a nurse by training and a public health specialist in Uganda, as well as the co-founder of the Community Health Movement in Uganda, where she leads the efforts to develop communications materials for community health workers who are interacting with patients who speak different languages and are from different areas within the country. She currently serves as the technical coordinator for East and Southern Africa at the Community Health Academy at Last Mile Health. And she is also an award-winning author and entrepreneur in Uganda who has been working with communities and youth on sexual and reproductive health. So we are delighted to have Tracy joining us today um, as our moderator. And she will be introducing our panelists um, and generally moderating today's discussion on what it will ultimately take to you know, be able to address these challenges um, that we're seeing with uptake and access in our communities. So it's gonna be a great discussion. I hope everyone on the line will also share your insights, your comments, your questions, and even your own experiences in the chat and in the Q&A box. Um, we hope to be able to get to as many uh, questions and insights from the audience as possible. Um, so with that, I am going to thank Tracy yet again um, for serving as our moderator. Um, and to Miriam, Gigi, and Yuram, who is also panelists, will be joining us just having a little bit of tech trouble. Um, so thank you to all of them for joining us, and I will pass it over to Tracy to introduce our panelists. Over to you, Tracy. Thank you, and thank you, Hannah. Welcome, everyone. Um, as Anna mentioned, I am Tracy Kovacindo, and I'm pleased to introduce our three panelists today. Before I do, though, Let's take a really quick poll. In the last six months, how many people have you had a discussion with about um, whether you should get the COVID-19 vaccine or not? And um, so you have, you have a poll now live, um, and we'll give you a minute or two to answer. And so if you've had the conversation, who have you had the conversation with about getting the COVID-19 vaccine. We'll just wait a minute um, for, you, for the participants to send in their answers. Okay. We have a few answers coming in. Um, about 17% are saying they've had a conversation with one to two people. About 38% are having this conversation with everyone they know. So 
So the highest number of participants say um, that they are having the conversation with everyone they know, which I can totally relate to because that's the one question I'm asking every single family member of mine is, are you getting the vaccine? Um, for those just joining us, I am based in Uganda and we just started rolling out the AstraZeneca vaccine about two weeks ago. So, you know, it's not surprising that the highest number of participants right now are having this conversation about whether we should, whether different people should take the vaccine or not. Um, there are a lot of questions. People are trying to find answers, um, get the confidence for what to do, and we're more likely to talk to trusted people about, about that. So how we communicate and how we understand people's concerns um, and, and whether we can find trusted members to discuss these issues with impacts the likelihood of medical uptake of any intervention in public health. Joining us today to discuss the important topic of addressing cultural barriers um, to vaccine uptake are Gigi Adi. Gigi Adi joins us from Brooklyn, New York, where she serves as the Director of Community Health and Wellbeing at the Arab American Family Support Center. She's a social worker and public health educator by training and currently oversees the organization's mental health, public health, emergency fund, and youth and young adult programming, which addresses the intersections between gender, race, religion, social economic class. Gigi is also a fellow alumna of GHC, having served at the Boys and Girls Club in Newark, uh, New Jersey. Welcome, Gigi. We are also joined by Miriam Chimba, who is based in Zambia and is a current GHC fellow and communications officer at PATH. She's working on their malaria control and elimination partnership in Africa, where she helps organizations tell their stories and shape their messages for a range of audiences in their communities. Prior to joining GHC, Miriam spent nearly 10 years as a radio personality, a media researcher, and contact person for social protection in the public sector, helping to drive conversations and messaging on key government policy pronouncements affecting the public. Welcome, Miriam. And lastly, we have Yoram Siame, who is also joining us from Zambia, where he is the head advocacy planning and development for the Churches Health Association of Zambia, which is CHAS. He supports the CHAS member institutions in the development and management of health facilities and oversees implementation of, of comprehensive advocacy and communication strategies. He has over 25 years of experience working in advocacy, organizational development and behavior change, including founding Youth Alive Zambia, serving on the boards and councils for multiple health organizations in Zambia and serving as a tech force throughout the country. Uh, very warm welcome to our three wonderful panelists. Um, to start us off, let's go to each of you and please share a little bit about your work in community health programming and addressing health intervention hesitancy. Please tell us more about how your work has addressed or shifted in looking at vaccine hesitancy and uptake in the community during the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's start with Gigi. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you, GHC, for the opportunity to be part of this panel. It's truly a pleasure to be here to discuss vaccine hesitancy and uptake in the communities that we serve. Um, you know, as Tracy mentioned, I work at the Arab American Family Support Center, and while our doors are open to all, we have a specialty in serving the Arab, Middle Eastern, and South Asian communities. And there's been a lot of hesitancy in the communities that we serve because of factors um, such as mistrust in the government systems or hearing about various different conspiracy theories um, that are spread widely throughout the community. Um, and one thing that we've been doing at the Arab American Family Support Center is creating COVID-19 vaccine informational webinars for our community members so that they can really truly understand the science behind the vaccine. Um, and, and not, you know, because there's a lot of misinformation out there, they can hear it from trusted physicians in the community as well. And so the approach that we've taken um, has really been asking our community members 
What are their concerns about the vaccines? What are there any fears that they have about taking the vaccine? And we went to them first. That was the first step in the whole process. Um, we asked them this question and we compiled all of the questions, con fears, concerns uh, that they had and looked at the questions, analyzed them, and then compiled a list of, uh, of themes that kept reoccurring across several different conversations that we've had with the community. Um, and, and so then we started approaching physicians within the community to discuss this. Um, and we, we were intentional about choosing physicians in the community because we know that our community members trust the physicians that they work with more than they do our government systems. Um, and so from there, that's where we started creating the webinars um, and the physicians were panelists. We also had a community member from the, or from the community be part of the panel as well. So it wasn't just physicians. We also wanted them to um, see someone else who they were familiar with as well that wasn't necessarily a physician. So we've hosted you know, several different webinars um, in Arabic and in English so far. Uh, and our approach was very embedded in the community. We wanted them to shape our approach in addressing vaccine hesitancy as opposed to us imposing information on them. Um, you know, we know that it's important to educate our community and the other pieces to connect the community to resources and making appointments to receive the vaccine. So our agency is also considered an authorized enroller uh, for the New York City Command Center. So these are just some of the things that we've been doing so far, um, but focusing on the community um, aspect of it. Thank you so much, Gigi. I really like the point about members on the panels because we are more likely to listen to people that we know that are from the community. So I think that's really important um, in, especially in community work. Um, I don't know if Yoram has joined us yet. Is Yoram on? I think he's still having no. tech difficulties. So okay. um, we can hear from Miriam. All right, maybe we can hear from Miriam. Um, Miriam, you're also working in Zambia with Perth um, in, in the community. Tell us a bit more about your work with the community and how it has shifted considering um, the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you so much, Tracy. And hi, everyone. Good morning and good evening. <laughs> Um, it's really, really nice to, to just be here. Thank you, GXC. And um, I was uh, very, very excited about just this opportunity to share some of the highlights on community engagement and, and, and how our work really has had to be very adaptive in nature because of the pandemic. Everything's been different. Um, so like Tracy said, I'm working with Path Masepa and a lot of the work that we do is to provide support uh, to the national program on malaria elimination here in Zambia and uh, provide the same kind of support to other national programs in Eastern and Southern Africa. And so the work in malaria specifically in Zambia is heavily hinged on community engagement and pushing back malaria in some of the high burden areas means that you have to go into the community because now most of the urban centers have been sensitized and you see that but just between um, over the last 20 years there's been almost a 50 percent reduction in malaria cases and uh, so the high burden areas are now in the rural areas and outside of Lusaka. And that's where most of our work has been focused, especially in, in the Eastern, Northern and Western part of the country. So because most of the work involves um, far flung areas, the mode of reaching and engaging uh, communities in rural areas is uh, a lot of um, in-person work. And because it's a lot of in-person work, we've heavily been impacted by, I can't say the vaccine 
yet or conversations about the vaccine, but we've definitely been impacted by the pandemic. Just at the beginning of last year, there were um, guidelines that were given by the Ministry of Health. And for instance, how many people you could have in a single gathering. And that means that you couldn't gather more than 50 people and there is no other mode of communication in rural areas. You have to be with people. You have to call this very huge meeting. So there's been a very slow passage of information and, um, and, and even an interruption of services or an interruption of um, messaging. We haven't been able to reach as much people as we normally would. Um, I, I can't even begin to talk about the, the huge interruption in services we noticed last year because most of the, most of the, the, the supplies that we, we get for malaria, whether it's diagnostics or drugs, uh, come from outside of the country. So there was a huge interruption in, in, in services because of the pandemic. And we saw um, a large amount of, of last year uh, that, that, that many communities were not reached and they did not have access for some time to the life-saving drugs and information that they need. And um, that that's, uh, really shows us why um, malaria, should continue to be a priority even during the pandemic because we could easily take a leaf from what happened in 2016 for instance with the ebola virus in west africa where there was actually more people dying that year from malaria than the actual virus and that is not what we want to see happen so it's we've had to really change our approach to keep up with the times Thank you so much, Miriam. Um, it's absolutely essential for us to ensure a continuity of essential health services, especially during the pandemic. I'm relating to my experience in, U in Uganda at the, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, there were actually people uh, falling sick and staying home because they were scared to go to the hospital because they thought that they would catch the virus from the hospital. And as a result, we had an increase in maternal deaths because you know people are delivering, preferring to, to deliver at home or not showing up for continental, for continental care or just you know catching malaria and staying back. So what the Minister of Health did was to um, create a training program that um, we called the Continuity of Essential Health Services, CHS, and uh, my organization, Last My Health. Um, uh, assisted in that, in putting it on, on an app so that it could be accessed by community health workers who would then take the message to the communities and say, you know, these are trusted members of, of the community. Um, and, and then they would tell the community members, you know, the hospitals are safe, you can go and get treated for malaria. There are all these um, uh, new measures that have been put in place so that you don't catch the virus from the hospital. and. From, from that, we have seen an improved health seeking behavior even during the pandemic, um, which is really important. But again, we went a few steps back, for example, in the treatment of tuberculosis or HIV AIDS, which are diseases, as you know, that, um, that whose prognosis is dependent on um, a, a daily intake of drugs or medicines. And if a patient skips one day or a week or a month, then you know prognosis becomes poor, and that adds the disease burden of the country. So I, I really appreciate the work that you're doing, especially um, in Zambia, and ensuring the the continuity of malaria services uh, in in your country. Um, you know, we do know that there are several models that support communities and individuals to take up medical interventions, right? Like vaccines. And the factors generally focus on confidence in the intervention or people leading it or communicating about it. Um, convenience in the process and overcoming complacency to act in the best interest of one, one's health and public health. Um, I think I would like to start with talking about confidence. What are some of the most effective ways 
you have seen public health practitioners learn from communities on how to support their health and progress. I know Miriam touched a little bit on this and, and Gigi as well, but if you could um, just share a bit more from your work, uh, what are the skills it takes for public health leaders to build this kind of confidence effectively? Um, we could start with Gigi. It would be great to hear your experience. Sure. And actually, before I start, I wanted to share something um, based off of what you shared, Tracy, when, when you mentioned that, you know, the communities were um, afraid to go to the hospitals because they were afraid of contracting, you know, malaria or the virus when, when, if they get there. And I actually saw something very similar here in New York with our communities um, when, co when the COVID outbreak first hit here in New York. A lot of our community members stated that they were very fearful if they had any symptoms of going to the hospital because from you know from what they said is if, if you go in you'll never come out because they've seen so many friends and relatives pass from the COVID uh, COVID-19 virus and so there's a lot of fear around that and many people weren't seeking health care or health services because they were afraid that if if they did that they would you know, pass as well. And so there was a lot of fear around that. And so I can see the similarities, although different viruses, but across communities and across the globe as well of, of the fear. Um, to answer your question regarding the, the confidence, um, I think it's important for our public health practitioners to really listen to the community's needs and not to assume that you know, we as public health practitioners know what the community's needs are. Um, you know, members of the communities are experts of their own lives. And so it's important that we don't tell them what to do, but rather learn from them, listen to their concerns and work collaboratively to address those concerns and support them in their health journey. Um, you know, too often I see, especially here, you know, in New York where, there are you know, health practitioners who obviously have the best interest of the community in mind, but don't have the best approach. And so I think you know, listening to the community is the first step. Um, and you know, when thinking about the skills that we need as public health practitioners, we need to be empathetic. Um, we need to really understand what is happening with our community and with the individual themselves. We need to be culturally sensitive and responsive. Um, as I mentioned, you know, there are many public health practitioners that want to see our communities thrive and be safe, but they don't have the cultural humility or uh, sensitivity. And that can really, you know, turn community members away from, you know, receiving essential services because they don't feel understood or heard. Um, we need to be supportive as well, you know, regardless, even if, if somebody doesn't, you know, want to take the vaccine um, or are fearful, we need to be supportive. We can't, um, you know, make the community member feel like they're wrong for feeling the way that they feel. And so I think these are just some, a, a few skills that we need to have as, as public health practitioners. And, you know, I think when the community knows and really truly feels that we have their best interests in mind, and that we actively listen and address their needs and their concerns, then they are able to build confidence in the intervention or the messaging because they know that we're with them every step of the way and that we're taking their voice and their opinions and their concerns into consideration. Thanks, Gigi. Uh, Miriam, you have something to add from your experiences? Maybe just um, a point of agreement, I agree with Gigi that empathy is big. It's a big um, skill that uh, public health practitioners need to develop during this time. We absolutely cannot assume, for instance, in communities here in Zambia, that people even know or understand what a vaccine is or how it works. So we cannot like overemphasize how important it is to get members of the community involved in these conversations from the very beginning, because you see a lot of centralization of information. And um, from the beginning of the pandemic, there was there's all these myths around 
uh, the, the pandemic, that it's a Western pandemic, or that uh, a, a lot of Westerners are the ones dying from this, and Africans are not dying from the virus. And that has been a very, very um, a critical point in even the driving the numbers here because of so much disbelief. So you can see that a lot of people um, have not been involved um, in these conversations by professionals from the very beginning, because it's like COVID is real in the hospitals and at the Ministry of Health. But if you go to specific homes or communities and worse off in rural areas, the reality um, may not, the reality of the, the, even the existence, some even doubting the existence. So how can we have on one section where we're sequencing COVID-19 some boys and in another part of the country, someone doesn't even believe that it exists. So that shows a gap already in involving the community in these conversations by professionals or building capacity in the community. I feel like that's, that's also a skill that's needed uh, to build capacity in people that influence communities. If you can get them to, to, to see that this is really important. I think it'll be easy to um, um, to sort of get to that community and and get them on board with uh, realizing that this is important and it's something that's affecting millions of lives. And that most importantly, that they have a part to play in all of this to ensure that they keep themselves and even their their families safe. So I think involving communities from the very beginning, um, being there to answer some of those concerns and also just creating a, a feedback loop. You want to know what's going on on the ground. So this is not just a one day thing. You don't just go there for one day and, and have this meeting and you leave because if you don't establish that feedback, how are you going to know uh, the concerns that are coming up um, in, the, in, in the next, um, uh, concerns as they arrive need to be met with actual actual answers from trusted people. So I feel like that could be a way in which we build confidence in, in, in the community in public health interventions is by including the community in conversations with professionals from the very beginning. Yeah. I, I mean, I couldn't agree more uh, about community engagement from the beginning. And I think that's why we're seeing um, so many countries in Africa in Asia, you know, in the Americas, they are embracing community health workers. Um, these are just normal people from the community, you know, maybe a religious leader, it may just be a person that uh, people listen to that is just doesn't have a leadership position in the community, but somehow when they speak, they are listened to. Um, we're seeing countries like Rwanda, you know, Uganda, Ethiopia, India, Bangladesh, Thailand, um, these countries have embedded community health workers into their health systems and they are reaping uh, immense benefits. They've just seen health seeking behavior go up, you know, adherence to medical interventions go up, a, a different attitude towards you know, public health interventions in the communities, um, tend, tending towards the positive, you know, positive trend. And I know that. Uh, we have about 190,000 community health workers in Uganda. And I know that the Ministry of Health is working to build an even larger pool of community health workers and uh, you know, train them even more on you know, various basic um, clinical interventions, but also give them the knowledge and skills that they need to be able to communicate effectively and communicate with confidence and give you know, accurate information to communities simply because we public health specialists, we may know we, we may know the diseases and we may know the, how they are spread and we may know the cure. But sometimes I think communication um, <laughs> by health workers to non-health workers can be somewhat uh, complicated in the translation, which is why we need uh, a sort of a go-between. Um, which brings us to our next question, which is about communication and community health. Where are some of the areas where we have seen medical interventions or best efforts at supporting community uptake go poorly? What were the driving factors um, to the failure or the underperformance of the efforts? Miriam, if I could start with you, if you could give us an example 
um, in Zambia or in your work in general where this happened? I could I could give um, a, a very recent example in some of the work that we've been doing with the with the national program, um, and I wouldn't say it's failed yet completely. No, it has not failed. We're getting back on track, but it's been such uh, a steep learning curve for us in the last year. And um, well, it would be easy to just blame the pandemic, but there is something there that we could take away. To, to incorporate in our future programming when it comes to um, uh, communicating. Um, well, last year, we launched a study on, on um, a new malaria intervention. So we're trying this intervention for the first time here in Zambia. And we're hoping that we, if we, we learn some lessons from the attractive Takeda Sugar Bay uh, intervention that we can apply those to other countries that are also pushing to eliminate malaria in, in, in Mali as well as the other African countries that are on board with the same agenda and just uh, we, were, we were doing this for the first time so um, at the attractive target sugar bait intervention is simply where you um, you hang a, a bait station outside of a home and it has um, 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 a sugary substance that is deadly to mosquitoes, but um, completely safe for, for humans. And so at the beginning of the last year, it's intended to reduce uh, mosquito populations. We're hoping that it, this could have a significant impact and that could help to push back mosquito populations and we have less and less of, of a spread of uh, malaria. So last year, um, we, we started the study in two areas in the western part of Zambia in Kaoma and uh, Keema district. And we went there and had meetings with community members. Now, because of it was the onset of the pandemic, there were guidelines from the Ministry of Health about not having more than 50 people, for instance, in one gathering. And so we thought, um, okay, we are going to entrust this information to this group of 50. And then we, we hoped that they would go into their communities and, and tell that news to everyone else so that the next time that a neighbor saw a bed station hanging on a house and it's not on theirs, that they would know what it was and what it was there for. And there was um, um, a little bit of a, we, so we left them there for a while and we're supposed to, to go back and to take down the numbers and to see the impact that those initial um, bed stations had had on the community. And that did not go very well. Um, there was a lot of uh, suspicion in the communities um, around what that bed station was. Others, other community members felt like, why is this on, on my house? It's bringing, actually bringing more mosquitoes here. Others suspected that it was some, some, um, some item maybe that was linked to witchcraft. And there was a lot of confusion around the intervention because the message had not gone across like we had planned. So what we have done uh, is now go back to the communities and uh, what we're trying to do to regain their trust and to get back on, tra on track with the study. And so when we went back, we found that some houses had even taken off the bed station, which really hampers the progress of the study. And so now we have gone back to the communities to, to, there's still some things we cannot do because of the pandemic, but we've had to adjust our approach and to sit down with the gatekeepers of those communities, traditional leaders and, and religious leaders and some influential people in the community and build capacity in them to be able to deal with some of those myths around the bait stations. And so now we're just not sort of like getting people together and then assuming that they take the message out there. We actually spend some time with these leaders and train them and created um, rapid response teams in I think almost 19 clusters now. So every single village, every single community, every cluster has people there that if you had a question or a concern, 
or there was confusion in the community about what that was, that there was someone to answer, to answer that. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but. Yeah, it does, Mary. I'm just out of curiosity. What did the bed station look like? And what was the size of the, of, of the thing? It's, um, well, it's, it's really small. It's, um, what can I compare it to? Maybe uh, it's really, a really phone? small. No, no, no. A little bit bigger than, maybe if you had like the general size of a, of a, of a smartphone and you put like four of them, so you can mm -hmm. see it, it's just enough to see, but it's not too big. And it has uh, uh, um, a black plastic like, um, uh, a pl plastic like a thing on the top. And then on the inside is where the, uh, the sugary substance is that is meant to, to be deadly to mosquitoes. Um, okay. All right, thanks Miriam. Gigi? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I didn't know if you were going to say something. Um, I, yeah, just to. Yeah, I, I actually was. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, so, Gigi, just a slightly different question for you, but also around communication. How, is, how have you been able to develop community capacity? Um, community capacity in, in regards to uptake to the vaccine or? Um, in, yeah, it could be to the vaccine, but it could also be to public health interventions in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, you know, for us, for, the, for them to be able to receive the information, um, one thing that, you know, it's, that's extremely important for us is to ensure that you know, just as mentioned before, that they're part of the process. And, um, you know, I, I've seen, going back to the previous question, were poor communication. So there has been times, especially when thinking about the COVID vaccine, that there was no communication to our community members. You know, if things were maybe blasted about COVID and how to protect oneself in English, um, but not in the languages that our community speaks, so not in Arabic or Bangla or, or do Hindi, and, you know, so on and so forth. And so we saw that our communities were severely impacted by COVID because there was absolutely no communication. Um, and we had to take things, matters into our own hands. You know, small community-based organizations had to work collectively together to create translated materials. And then we would go to the you know, bodegas, the restaurants, the shops in the neighborhoods and post them all around um, in the languages of the community so that they're able to understand and realize that you know, they need to wear a mask um, and how to protect themselves. Because in the beginning, there was no social distancing, far, like, far too many, pe uh, few people were wearing masks. They, you know, they thought that COVID wasn't really much of an issue because the messaging wasn't getting to them. Um, and so, so these are some things that we had to do on our, on our end. Um, and now I think, you know, the government is obviously getting a lot better with messaging and making sure that it is translated um, in languages that our community speak as well. But in the beginning, it, it wasn't, it wasn't very prevalent. Um, and so, you know, for, for our communities, we had to, you know, the question was, why aren't people adhering to the requirements? But then we realized that it's because there was no communication with them. Um, and so, you know, just talking to them, understanding what the needs were, what was happening, and then responding to the needs in that way. Thanks, Gigi, for sharing that. Um... Uh, maybe I'll just share a little bit about, you know, from my own experience in, in Uganda, especially with the, with the coming of the, of the vaccine, um, which is right now for health workers, teachers, and um, other frontline health workers, and also people who are aged above 60 years. But I think um, the mistake that, oh, something that we could have done better as health practitioners in this country and also public health you know specialists is to have designed uh, a campaign 
um, to inform the population about the vaccine that they were going to get. So what we did instead was to educate the health workers, uh, the community health workers, uh, the frontliners, so nurses, doctors who underwent a training to give the vaccine. And also we had um, you know, one, week, one week training for them, for the whole country where my organization also participated. But I think the gap then that was left was in informing the non-medical practitioners or the non um, frontline health workers, other members of the community who have now started, you know, perpetuating these rumors that AstraZeneca causes, you know, to, like if a breastfeeding mother then gets the vaccine, then the child will be infertile for the rest of their life, or that AstraZeneca is causing clotting in a hundred percent of, you know, of recipients, which is not true. Because in Uganda, we have vaccinated about 41,000 people and we have had minor incidents of adverse effects in about only 54 and nothing serious like clot. But this is information that is only available to health workers. So other community members, media, journalists, everyone is just reporting um, cons conspiracies, very popular here. And I think that if we had designed a campaign to address them or anticipated them which has happened with other with other uh, medications for example for malaria when we're changing from quinine to 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 quartan from one drug to another we could have then um, dispelled any myths or conspiracies before they arose but now you know when we're starting out at this webinar we asked a question to the participants have you been having conversations about taking up the covid vaccine with other people, and so it is. It is not just the 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 health workers' decision, but it is also it sort of becomes like a communal decision, because because their decisions are informed by the people that surround them. So if the family members of a health worker have not been informed properly about the AstraZeneca vaccine, then the conversations around the dinner table, around the lunch table that the health worker is going to be exposed to are anti-vaccine you know, conversations. And we all love our family members and sometimes we shall hesitate to do things just because someone we trust does not trust that intervention. So I agree communication is a really big, um, it's, it's, a, it's a big, tool for for lack of a better word that that can be used to address um, public health intervention hesitancy especially when it comes to you know vaccine uptake um so with that i think um uh, i would like to switch specifically again i think this has happened naturally i'd like to officially switch to covid19 with many communities just at the beginning of the COVID-19 vaccine rollout, uh, but with lots of anticipation, misinformation and past experiences around you know, medical interventions, what are the best practices these global health leaders can take now? Gigi, you are specifically working on COVID-19 vaccine uptake. Could you share more on how your organization is addressing the issue? Absolutely. I think when, when thinking first about how global health leaders can take action now, I think the most important thing, and I think this has kind of been a highlight throughout the conversation today, is to never discount the community um, and what they're informing you or telling you. Even if it sounds ridiculous to you, if they're telling you some sort of conspiracy theory that sounds ridiculous to you, I think it's extremely important to not discount that. From them, um, you know, there's a lot of misinformation spread, but it's important to hear out the community's concerns. Um, and I think it's also important to not use fear tactics when speaking to our community members, um, because if they're motivated by fear, the inter intervention likely will not be effective. Um, and so that's that's something that we as global health leaders want to, you know, stay away from. 
Um, supportive messaging and gentle encouragement is key. Um, I think, you know, talking about pros and cons about the vaccine um, and being transparent is extremely important. You know, talking about the side effects, but also inform them that the side effects are temporary, um, you know, and, and just being as transparent as possible because I think, you know, people obviously can see through if you're trying to cover up something. And so, um, you know, just being upfront with them is extremely important. Some of the things that we're doing currently at the Arab American Family Support Center is to continue the informational webinars as I spoke about uh, before. You know, we've hosted one in English, we've hosted one in Arabic, we've had several thousand views for each of the videos and we're currently planning one in Bangla as well. Um, we're also training our staff on messaging. So this also goes to your conversation about community health workers. That's extremely important. So, um, you know, our organization is embedded within the community. We have folks within our organization. While their titles aren't community health workers, their work is very similar to community health workers. They do go into the homes of our community members. Um, and so it's extremely important that they also know how to talk to their clients and, and the community about the vaccine in a culturally responsive manner. Um, you know, as mentioned, we are a New York City authorized enroller for the COVID-19 vaccine appointments. And so much of my current efforts right now has been focusing on getting staff trained on how to make the appointments for community members and navigating the several different websites. You know, that, that in itself can be complicated. Um, I can't imagine if I didn't know how to speak, um, read or write in English, how to navigate that myself. And so, um, you know, working with our staff in order to be trained in that specifically um, is something that we're currently doing. We also have a community outreach cohort, which is dedicated to reaching out to community members who are not already connected to our agency, informing them about the vaccine and how to contact our agency to make appointments and um, have assistance with making appointments or just general information about the vaccine, uh, you know, if they're hesitant for whatever reason. Um, and lastly, you know, partnering with other community-based organizations has been uh, crucial in our efforts as well. Um, you know, letting them know that we offer these services, that they can refer, you know, their community members to our, our agency for more information and for us to help them make the appointments, but also just continuously to have the open communication and conversation with one another about what's working, what's not working um, for our communities, because, you know, our efforts, when we work collectively, we have more impact as opposed to working in silos. And so our approach has been holistic. It's been a holistic approach. We're trying to reach the community in a variety of different ways. Um, and so that they know that they can come to us as a trusted organization within the community. Um, thanks, Gigi. You did mention something about um, not dispelling all the conspiracy theories or the information that may not be so accurate that is um, within the community, but instead taking that on and um, then trying to give the correct information to the community. I think that is really important because um, res research shows actually that people who come up with these theories, they just get a specific piece of research and just blow it out of out of proportion and um, that most often what then needs to be done is to just bring in uh, the bigger picture of the research that was done instead of focusing on that a small tiny pocket that is being then shared widely on social media. I think it's really important also you know sometimes maybe to just develop an FAQ, uh, FAQ sheet for communities and just address address their fears and their myths or conspiracies because they're not either they get new accurate information or they will stick to their conspiracies yeah absolutely i think that is very important um we do have let's see if we have a question we have a question for miriam in the q a miriam in your opinion uh are we doing enough in preparing communities for the vaccine in zambia 
the vaccine is not yet available, but it looks like the groundwork has not begun. I've not seen any IEC materials or adverts on TV. Um, an anonymous attendee is concerned. Over to you, Miriam. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, I feel like we have a lot of ground to cover when it comes to the COVID-19 vaccine. I think that we are, we can do more to prepare people. I know that we have about a month in between. Well, we're set to receive the first uh, uh, doses of the vaccine, uh, which will cover 20% of the population in early May. I think it's 1.2 doses, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there hasn't yet been any uh, direction given as to who will be prioritized and how the vaccine will be deployed. But I think that we can definitely do more to talk, to have more conversations about the COVID-19 vaccines, because I think there's been, excuse me, a lot of apprehension around receiving, not just the COVID-19 vaccine, but even in the past, receiving this, the other vaccines or other medical intervention with a, a, a history of uh, uh, was the westernization of medicine saying this is something that's coming from the outside how are we supposed to trust it you hear a lot of those conversations around the community i think that we can do more um as health practitioners there is need to create a system that includes real stories about people that have been impacted by the virus uh, for instance people that have recovered from the virus i have not seen people come out in the open and or uh, for for um, uh, public health um, practitioners take advantage of those stories or request maybe doctors and nurses that are working with patients to actually pronounce what is going on in the hospital. So you don't see a lot of that covered in, in the media either. We have so much to do. I feel like um, we can do more to create a system that brings in real stories and shows real impact and perhaps even involve uh, the families of those that have lost someone from COVID-19 because if uh, our communities are not, uh, if, if we're not convinced or I'm not convinced as an individual that the, the virus is impacting that many people or that my life is at risk, how, how, how are we even going to start talking about a vaccine when there is still a lot of misconceptions around uh, the occurrence of, 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 of COVID-19 itself. So I feel like we have a lot of ground to cover and we can do more to heavily push those conversations or uh, we could face a situation where a lot of people are complacent. Maybe um, I could actually share a story from about a month ago or two um, at a school where a rumor went round that the, 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 the high scholars would be, um, would be vaccinated uh, upon returning to school that they would need to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. And they literally ran away from, from the school here in Lusaka. Uh, lots and lots of kids just afraid of the idea that someone is going to be injecting me with so you can see that there's a lot of um, misconceptions and uh, there's definitely need to do more around raising awareness, not, not, not just of the vaccine, but around the pandemic as well. And the, the, the real effect that it has had on, on, on public health in Zambia and that it might have if we don't do everything that we can to, to contain it. I couldn't agree more, Miriam. Thank you for that um, really good answer. And we have one more question uh, from the audience. It's from James. And James says, with all the different vaccines uh, and their difference in efficacy, especially with the South African variant, how do we handle the argument of most people in communities preferring to use remedies or remedies to more or less fight the virus than seek out the vaccine. Gigi, if you want to take a shot. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I have the, the answer to this question, but I do think 
it goes back to messaging and having conversations with the community members, you know, not to discount if they want to use remedies to fight the vaccine that, you know, absolutely, they can go ahead and do that. We don't want to tell them to stop doing what they're doing if they, you know, if they think that it's working and it may or may not work. I'm not sure. I'm not one to, to say that it's not going to work, but I also think that it's important to, you know, have a conversation and, and, um, and say, you know, like, you know, if this is working for you, you definitely go ahead and use it. Um, but also thinking about um, the facts, you know, going back to the facts and the science behind what is happening currently across the globe because of COVID-19 and how many people have been affected, how many people, you know, there are, there are several people who have gotten COVID-19 and have recovered, myself being one of them. Um, but there are also, unfortunately, individuals who have gotten it and never recovered and unfortunately passed. And so, you know, just we again, we don't want to use fear tactics with any community members, but stating facts and then the science behind, um, you know, the the vaccines. And so if individuals are um, afraid of the vaccine or hesitant to take the vaccine for whatever reason. And I know that at least here in the US, the Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson vaccines aren't um, necessarily the fighting against the South African uh, variant of COVID-19, but it still protects you from the, the other variants. Um, and just you know, having this conversation with individuals, I guess it really depends on where they're at, <laughs> you know, the individuals where they're located, what country they're in, um, and what's happening within the country. But, um, you know, just coming from an empathetic place and understanding place, hearing out the individual's concerns and, and stating facts is probably the best way to go about it. Thanks, Gigi. Um, before we close, I'm seeing we have two minutes to close. We, before we close, I want to do one lightning round question for, for both our panelists. What is the one thing you want all public health practitioners and anyone working in the community health uh, space to consider when addressing medical interventions and COVID-19 vaccine uptake in communities? Let's start with Miriam. What is that one thing? Um, I think the the one thing I'd like um, practitioners to know is that let's let's not assume anything when it comes to the COVID nineteen pandemic or the vaccine. There is need to start those conversations, if, even as 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 far as what let's let's not assume that someone knows even what COVID is or how, how it's, by, by now it's gotten around to how it spreads, but to really understand, like Gigi said, the science behind it. Uh, let us not assume anything. We need to keep sensitizing the community, creating opportunities for more and more of these conversations, creating feedback loops so that you can really know what's going on in the minds of, of the people and also just killing the, the, the jargon around COVID. It's been very scientific in the discussions. And, and, and for a community in a far-flung area, how are they supposed to understand all, all these um, medical terms linked to that? So I think that as, as public health practitioners, more can be done to simplify that language to be able to reach all kinds of communities. With, with the right message about COVID-19, but let's not assume anything. There's still a lot of work to do to kill uh, the mistrust and seeing that we're all transitioning as a global uh, community, we're trying different approaches just to see which one is actually going to work. So this cannot be um, um, a one-sided conversation. It cannot be one that you impose on people. What if you impose something and then it doesn't work or the approach changes? So we need to move together, um, both um, as practitioners and as a community in, in understanding where we're at when it comes to the discussions about the vaccine and the virus. Thank you so much, Miriam. And Gigi, uh, one second. Yes, yeah, so similarly to Miriam, I think just making sure that we're including the community's voice in every step of the process, when planning, when outreaching, when implementing, when evaluating the intervention, the community needs to be part of the whole process. You can't create an inter intervention for the 
community without the community. So that's that's kind of what, what I'll leave it at. Wow, thank you so much, Miriam and Gigi. Um, I've really learned a lot and enjoyed our conversation. I hope that um, the attendees also feel the same. Over to you, Hannah. Thank you so much, Tracy. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. Um, this conversation was incredibly interesting and lots of really wonderful thoughts. Uh, and I wish we could keep it going. Um, but I just want to say a huge thanks to our panelists, Miriam and Gigi, and to you, Tracy, for such a wonderful and informative session. A uh, huge thanks from GHC and a huge thanks to everyone um, who is on the line um, for coming to our Shift Happen session um, and sharing your questions and your insights as well. Um, we appreciate all of the time that you have shared with our community. Um, just as a reminder to GHC community members, please feel free to share, continue the conversation going on our community portal for others joining us um, to continue the conversation on our social media platforms. Uh, there is so much um, that we've learned from building capacity to you know, really thinking about how to empathize and not focus on dispelling the myths, but focus really on <clears throat> the information and making sure that we're getting accurate uh, content out there. And I love um, Tracy's quote that um, we hesitate to trust if people we trust don't trust. Uh, and so how important it is to really be involved in this as a community, um, not as individuals. And that's how we can really tackle some of this hesitancy um, that might be there. So thank you again to our panelists, um, Gigi and Miriam, and to Tracy for such a wonderful and informative session. Um, thank you to everyone who's joining. We wish you a wonderful and a very healthy day. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.